When Gerard Samuel accepted my invitation in the late spring this year, I was truly delighted. As an advocate for dance and the marginalized, in his words read as black, disabled, queer bodies, Samuel brings a wealth of experience to our conversation. Welcome, Gerard. Thank you very, very much, Katrina. It's lovely to be here and to join your guest lecture series. Let's go back to the beginning, Gerard. Where and when did your interest in dance and or performance begin to emerge in your studies? Gosh, that's a, a very broad uh, question for me, given my, my journey in dance is a long one. I began, as you perhaps know, as a, as a ballet dancer, as a little boy, as age eight in a tiny town uh, on the east coast of, of our country working in classical ballet and uh, then continued that journey here at the University of Cape Town where I'm currently uh, head of dance. So I have quite an unusual journey, um, perhaps uh, having come from an, an Indian community in the, in the North Coast and to access this very particular Western form, although maybe we'll get into some of that a little later uh, today. Um, about how these cultures come together and, and what that might mean for this term, a brown dancing body. Um, but my intersection into the university began after my performance career ended as a classical ballet dancer. And I was interested to pursue um, further study in academia. At that point, I had uh, completed a diploma in ballet, but I was interested in postgraduate study and that encountered the field of disability arts. And I think that was one of the, the key moments as a, as a journey for me, as well as the idea of contemporary and contemporary ballet. And again, that's something I've most recently written about. So those two parts uh, perhaps intersect in my um, engagement with the University of Pazulu Natal and specifically Leanne Lutz. She plays a very big role in my life uh, around introducing me into the broader discourses for dance studies and for performance studies. And I was fortunate then to pursue an honors and a master's degree at the University of KZN, which then began my journey as an academic. One of the, the in order to talk about um, sort of the black dancing body and the brown dancing body that we're gonna go into um, through this conversation, we're gonna sort of explore this a little bit mm. further. Um, obviously you grow up, grew up in South Africa and it's very important for particularly those who may be sort of familiar with the context of where dance resides within the context of South Africa. We cannot not talk about um, pre and post apartheid, you know, mm. sort of existence. Could you just briefly in a nutshell, um, talk us through the sort of, uh, changes and the shifts between uh, the sort of or the impact of apartheid within yeah. within dance more importantly. Yeah, I think you know one of the things that I teach on a course that I lead at the moment called South African Performance Genealogies, and we look at the gaps in our histories in dance. And one of the important issues that surface time and time again is understanding the context of the performing arts councils and specifically the cultural boycott and the way in which that had an impact on who was dancing, what kinds of dances were being valued, uh, what kinds of productions were being made, what was being spoken about in and through dance. And um, so for, for me, yeah, that, that whole period in our history from, from the 60s and the way in which some dance forms were privileged as high art and others were considered to be folk forms. Uh, yet one could make an argument for classical Zulu dance as an, exa as an example. Um, so yes, the apartheid years had an extraordinary impact on the way in which um, certain spaces were not available to dancers. Dancers did not have, all dancers across our country didn't have access to further education and training in dance. Um, and so that meant that whole areas of dance uh, were invisibilized in that in that process. And so to um, for young dancers who came from black communities, and by black here I'm referring to all who were classified during the apartheid period as being non-white, uh, obviously the normative position for whiteness here, um, 
so the, these dancers would have had an enormous challenge in which to both express themselves individually as artists, but also the cultural spaces from which they were birthed. Um, and this radically shifts in the Mandela moment in our 1994 moment in the, the birth of our democracies in which the performing arts councils collapsed. We no longer have uh, ballet, opera, Western orchestras being supported in, in the same way and to a hugely imbalanced uh, funding process. All of that radically changes. We then have the establishment of a national arts council um, where artists are able to access funds even though right at this present moment, some of these organisms in the state are, are really shoddy. Um, and there's much protest around the fact that we're not getting the kind of support as artists as we, as we need. So broadly, yeah, the, the, the two kind of legs that one stands in, in, in 2021 has to consider the apartheid moment very specifically and what that meant for the bodies and the dance forms and the places for training um, or certainly thinking about dance and then the period after the democracy because we well into our you know 20 more than 20 years at this point and much is changing around dance uh, in our country and specifically dance uh, in terms of concert theater dance i mean in 2012, Sharon Friedman published her, her book, Post-Apartheid Dance, a chapter of which you contributed as well. Mm. Um, and of course, for those who are unfamiliar or want to kind of learn, you know, learn more about the context, certainly um, Post-Apartheid Dance is a real sort of key text. Um, has there been some change? Have you seen change in the last decade? any sort of shift mm. in the last decade? Yeah, I, I think, you know, for, it was a wonderful opportunity for us to gather our thoughts around what was happening in the immediate aftermath of the collapse of apartheid. And I think that book articulates that really, really well. Um, but perhaps what's happened since then, and as you say, in the last 10 year period, we've dealt with the major shifts, certainly at the university have been around the student protests, the call for free education, the, uh, big issues around decolonization and the way in which that's having impact and what we teach and how we should even teach. These issues are being destabilized uh, radically. Um, but at the same time, it's a, a rupture that I think is, is important. It's something that we should be thinking about, um, you know, or we just stagnate in terms of, of the form. And so for me, when it comes to looking at uh, ballet, classical ballet, and then more specifically contemporary ballet, it becomes so important to locate that form in the southernmost tip of Africa and, and to argue for what, what could be its value, what could be its role, and who are the persons who are thinking about that. Uh, and there certainly are a few. I mean, back in 2017, uh, the University of Cape Town ran a conference on decolonialization way before, you know, the sort of, you know, UK and Americans sort of shifted to that agenda of decolonialization mm. or beginning to get our heads around what does it mean in real terms. So in a way, for me, as a sort of academic living in the United Kingdom, I kind of look to, to Cape Town in terms of what you did in 2017 and those conversations on decolonialization mm. of dance already happening yeah. um, and it was almost already in your blood really right was yeah that something yeah I, I, I mean I think it's it's also important to say in a public space like this evening about how University of Cape Town played a very specific role in that whole toppling of the, the road statue. I mean, yes, it's an, uh, it's an external marker, kind of a tip of the iceberg of something that's happening in our country that's part of a much wider global phenomenon that we are all thinking about. And you correct in saying that perhaps at that moment in, in time, whilst the issue was very much the hot topic and uh, had reached a kind of boiling point, it, uh, it made most sense to us as academics in the region, in the Southern African region, to come together, as we have done since the late 1990s, to hold a conference, a space of academic freedom to discuss what might these issues be and how do we resolve them, how do we re, uh, you know, constitute our, our curricula um, in response to the calls that are uh, so widespread and at that point so loud. 
um, because the student protest that's 2015. Mm. Absolutely. Um, and in a way, even not just a year makes a difference, but five, six years almost, you know, you're talking about a significant mm. period of time. Mm. Let's come I mean, back to... Uh... Sorry, Katrina, I just wanted to, to, to ask or, or, or to extend that, that, that point just a little, um, to say that also interesting in that development of the conference that came in 2017, was the follow on that after an 80 year period or more than 80 year period and the establishment of the school of of dance prior to that known as the ballet school i mean arguably this is one of the oldest schools for dance attached to a university anywhere on the globe its formation is in 1934 that institution changed radically at the point of 2018, where we then merged with the drama department. So today we've got this extraordinarily long and sometimes uncomfortable um, title, the Center for Theater, Dance and Performance Studies. Um, but that's an, a very significant moment, I think, in our country uh, for the way in which uh, much of, of our, um, the role that we, we play, the role that we, each of our universities play in our leadership around dance studies and, and theater and, and performance has meant a deep thinking, a deep unsettling around what performance should be and, and, how, and how we could be responding. I know, Gerard, you want to show some video clips. And I think in terms of returning mm. back to, um, you know, the sort of agency of the young black dancer um, and our narrative will unfold over the next sort of uh, 20 to 30 minutes anyway. So um, let's get started with showing yes. uh, a short clip. Would you like to introduce the Dance for All clip to like load it up? Yeah. My yes, uh, perhaps yeah, for our audiences who are less familiar with this organization, this is an organization that in some sense is one refers to as a community-based organization, but they also are their own little company. It's a pity that Alison Hendricks, who's the artistic director of the company, isn't available to us tonight. She's uh, adjudicating for the South African International Ballet Competition, which opened yesterday. But here's an example of the kind of work that's happening in ballet that's located very much in the heartland of, of Cape Town, in the Athlone area, in an area that would otherwise be termed a colored township or what was once a uh, formerly colored only township. And let's take a look at mm -hmm. what this company is attempting to do. Gerard, just let me know when you want to pause the video because I'm mindful ah. it's, it's a little ah. bit long. Yeah. Okay. When I dance, I feel free. When I dance, I feel like a warrior. When I dance, I feel like I feel like I'm in heaven. A friend of mine, we were very close together and we were at the same school together. So she came to my house after school saying that to, to me that there were dance classes happening near where we, we were staying in Kukuletu. And she said to me, let's go and try out these classes. And I said, what is it? Dance class? What dance? She said to me, it's a Pali class. When I went back to my, to my, to my grandmother, so I was telling her that, hey, granny, I went to this Pali class. But I must tell you, it was a very difficult class and i told her that i am never ever going back to that class again so my granny said to me no my child i think you should go back again and maybe this ballet thing will make you somebody one day well i think having been a professional dancer all my life i was a professional principal dancer with the ballet company for 23 years and it always worried me very much that there were no black dancers and that was really my motivation for creating an organization like this it really upset me i love children and it was my kind of mission to create a space and a place for children in these disadvantaged areas to have a proper dance training. We've really become more than just dance teachers. We become parents, really, to all of our children that we teach. And the children rely so much on us. It really is a lifeline for these students. At the age of 12, my, my father died, 30, 11 months after my mother died as well. Um, I have three brothers, Bradford, the one I'm living with, 
immediately he had the responsibility to take care of me a 13 year old son i mean he doesn't he's not even married yet but he has to take care of me i showed no emotion towards losing my parents for the first year i was quite isolated i also used dance to you know to release the pressure of what is actually going on in my life um uh, through hip hop i would act out because hip hop is a genre where you actually in people's faces and you doing your thing you showing attitude and that's that's why it came so easily to me and it became so natural for me to do and that's why it was kind of hard for me to go to ballet in contemporary because it seemed so so gentle and that's probably what i needed in my life as well thank you katrina So yeah, this is part of a much longer um, clip that I'm sure others can pick up again on YouTube after our session this evening. But I wanted to illustrate two points really here, which you know come at the beginning of the video. The first is this question of ballet as a proper dance training. Um, it's something that in, in terms of the decolonial conversations, these are things for us to think about. Statements like ballet is a universal form uh, that it would have application for all kinds of dance. And then the relationship between ballet and other forms of dance. In the example that Nathan mentions here, and he, he talks about uh, hip hop being rough and tough uh, and ballet being gentle. So if we can start with the latter, it's, it's interesting for me how ballet very often gets placed in this ephemeral space, in this very ethereal space, when I've certainly seen ballets that are extremely rough and tough, um, I'm thinking right now, Katrina, about uh, Troy Game, which is about to open. The Cape Town City Ballet are about to, to perform this work next week or the first week in, in, in November, along with Diri Killian and uh, George Balanchine's Concerto Barocco. So, you know, an interesting program there that can, can show you both athleticism on the one hand, a very masculine approach in, in ballet, which is it interesting for me about which aspects of the form are most been, been amplified the most or are the most visible? And the questions become why and who is responsible for this, this image of ballet as being the self. You know, there she is uh, balancing very daintily on the tip of the rosebud. That enduring lithograph image, uh, to, what, to what extent is that part of our problem with ballet? That's one part of the question I, I have. And then the other is this question that I've often asked myself. If I'm a boy from, well, in my case, a, a Jewish named Catholic boy from Zululand who comes from an Indian household. So let's swallow that, right? So how would I deal with, uh, if equally my name was Temba Mkize and I'm from Chakaskrol and my grandfather or uncles have been teaching me in Zamu, why would I need to know ballet? And what would, or if I was Timbelisle or Sipesisle and I would now have to be in point shoes, what would be the value of that process? So on the, on the one hand, there's much to be said about the value of the, the, the technique uh, and the technical way in which our bodies extend themselves in terms of uh, our strength, our agility, et cetera, but also the cultural coding that comes with this particular type of strength. So it's a strength that, that asks for your back to be upright um, as, you know, in, in, to some extent, of course, we, we know that we are also required to do back bends in ballet, um, but you might never be required to shake your shoulders in a particular way that might be coming from specific African dance forms. So I find it quite interesting in our discussion of black dancing bodies, these two parallel thoughts the one about the universalizing of ballet and uh, the other about the roles and responsibilities that all of us have, particularly the media. And now that we individually have access to social media, what are the dominant images of ballet that we put out there, both in terms of this question of the ideal dancing body type that is something in ballet, and then that larger question in dance in general, what is the notion of an ideal uh, dancing body? You know, is Gerard in his late 50s an ideal dancing body? 
Do I have to be a particular weight, a particular size? Can my ass be uh, in a particular range, et cetera, et cetera? Because we've seen, we've seen certainly in our South African choreographers who challenge us in extraordinary ways to think about what has this meant when your teacher has said your bum is too big? What has that meant to us in terms of a kind of trauma that's set in our bodies? And this question of the traumatic body um, is something that's enduring for me in the way in which I consider what is the experience here in South Africa that deals with such a range of traumas, the trauma of a 400 year colonial history, the apartheid moment, and then our specific traumas right now. The, one of the most unequal spaces on the planet dealing with COVID-19. Um, and all of that, I think, is having impact on, on what we understand about ballet or the form that, that those of us who love it and, and, and understand it, all of these things are part of that conundrum. I mean, so many of us are having these conversations on why are the arts important? I mean, in any part of the world, in terms of actually saving the arts or making sure that they don't die a death as a result of, mm. um, you know, sort of the impact um, of COVID. Um, but I recently, I was doing a bit of my own research, of course, and I was looking up um, uh, Debbie Turner, who's the CEO of Cape Town City Ballet, talks about, you know, the role, and I'm digressing the conversation mm. onto mm -hmm. the, you know, the importance of the Black South African choreographer, um, where, you know, she really talks about this idea that unless the choreographer is recognized outside of South Africa, they are not necessarily recognized internally yet as being, you know, the sort of cultural makeup. Um, mm. And of course, goodness me, you know, with with um, cuts to the art and, and reduced seating, and of course now I, I understand sort of mm. seating capacity has increased. It's so important that the arts continue to be less of the privileged and more mm. of the sort of you know um, accessible ac accessible um, in terms of you know getting audiences in. So that's a bit of a conundrum. However, let's talk a little bit about South African choreographers. Um, mm. You recently wrote, um, certainly in the book that I've edited, the Oxford Handbook of Contemporary Ballet, a wonderful chapter introducing uh, two choreographers, the first of which uh, was uh, Mtutu Zeli November. Um, and I'm going to hand over to you in terms of really mm. talking about the importance of having this uh, young, we'll call him young, uh, black male South African choreographer, mm. and lots of different mm. sort of adjectives to describe yes, yeah. this um, yeah. creative person. Yeah, I mean, Chitizeli is certainly a phenomenon that, you know, one could spend an hour on, on our own just talking about his, his work, the ideas, the vision, the hopes that he represents. But I also think it would be important to acknowledge the kinds of works that have been done that Debbie had alluded to, um, the idea of the African ballet or the black ballet in South Africa, where are these works? And again, I think there's quite a lot of misinformation about whether the African subject or mythology has been engaged within ballet. And for very many people, they cite this as something happening, happening you know, sort of post-1994. Uh, the little research that I've done in this area points to much, much earlier histories with very, very interesting persons, including Darcy Howes, who had engaged with these topics, right? South African based stories. Um, but often maybe this is clouded by, you know, these persons labels as white choreographers in an apartheid world supported by an apartheid government who then funded the performing arts councils. So a work like Flay Legend, for example, you know, choreographed by Dalsey House herself, doesn't necessarily get recognized as a South African work. And then similarly, you could find a whole host of, you know, what I discuss in my chapter around the Afrikaans ballet. So you, you would be able to look at uh, papers, Veronica papers, Dridera, there was Harry Haller, there's a whole host of them that exist as, and Christopher Kendo's works. So there's a whole host of these ballets that have existed, but are not generally widely known, and they have certainly not enjoyed the kind of support that the standard mix of Giselle, Sleeping Beauty, Swan Lake, and, I, you know, th that these works continue to be 
dance, um, they, they continue to be the benchmark for ballet. Mm -hmm. And, and this becomes problematic if we're saying not only do we want to advance black stories, but also we want to advance the black choreographer. And I, I must say, I would tend to agree with, with Debbie Turner that the idea that someone you know, is only celebrated when their work seems to come from uh, and has been lauded somewhere else. Uh, I mean, I think of my own journey returning to Cape Town and having been in Copenhagen and worked in that. I wondered to, to some extent whether my my work that I saw as a rather simple, gentle piece called Who Says the Ugly Duckling, which was birthed in Copenhagen and then had an opportunity for performances here in South Africa. I wonder whether to what extent that its reception was because it came from Denmark, as opposed to I was making stories like The Man I Love, I was making uh, ballets like Prabhati, which at that, you know, these are a ballet company dancing to classical Indian music in the 1980s, somewhere in the 1980s. Um, so so it's, it's interesting for me that whilst we pick up on Tutuzeli November, Dada Masilo, Nelly, uh, Mamela, Nyamza and others, Desiree Davids, you know, for doing the most extraordinary ballets at the, at the time, we must also link them to the earlier histories uh, because they come from a trajectory uh, that includes David Poole, that includes Johar Mosseville, Augustus van Heerden. There's, you know, there's all these other artists that have been known, but so much more work needs to be done to uh, make the general public aware which is why I think I remain a teacher. I enjoy that space that can pass on that knowledge to my students to say, you guys are now the custodians of this knowledge. What are you going to do with this? And, and how can we celebrate uh, these, these forgotten artists and these black choreographers? Um, when it comes to the choreographers of the present moment, somebody like um, Tutuzeli, I think it might be wise if we, we can jump to his, uh, the clip of his in Goma that I sent to Katrina, because again, this particular work has received uh, a lot of traction and uh, it might be a nice segue here to have a look at, at his at Tutuzeli's um, uh, work called Ngoma. So before we start, maybe we might just want to say that this was choreographed um, in 2019, I believe, uh, for Ballet Black in the United Kingdom. And then this summer set for uh, Cape Town City Ballet, so in 2021. But we're going to watch the cast of Ballet Black, so the Ballet Black Company performing. Here we go. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Katrina. I mean, it's a pity perhaps we didn't get all of the sound in, in that clip. I'm not too sure if others heard it as clearly. It's a bit fuzzy on my end. But the clip at any rate gives us uh, um, some insight into the kind of movement vocabulary that Tutuzeli is, ex is exploring. And also, perhaps it, it, it forces us to think about uh, our own uncomfortability if that did arise in seeing a white male somebody performing gambut dance. And I know certainly in the performances that I saw here in, in Cape Town that that visceral response was certainly in the audience. And there's something to be said about the way in which our bodies are culturally inscribed and where these markers come from, who can perform which dance, which body can perform which form of dance, and how do we, we cross that? And how do we cross that even now, 20 years on, in the so-called new South Africa, right, where supposedly we are all one nation? The reality, of course, is very far from that, that in fact, the difference is as marked as it ever was, even with all of the progress that one's made in terms of social cohesion and the kind of work that we do. 
and perhaps this uh, you know allows us to to think about what is the role of dance what is the role of dance what is the role that ballet can play in terms of healing if we saying that this form was a form that stood on its pedestal you know with the tutu and the rest of us staring up the long pink leg um, what can it at this point in time be doing in the way in which that rever those roles can be reversed. So I think about Mamela and Nyamza's apartheid that, that, that she wrote and the way in which she demonstrates this kind of axis and off axis moment that we have that works like Tutuzeli allows us to, to understand not only the pain and the sorrow of the women folk who have their men leaving to go and work on the gold mines and the reef, but also his engagement with um, the whole, the whole idea of loss, grief, and then also hope. Um, and I think that these kinds of, of works inspire not only the younger dancers in terms of the way in which you could have this collision of, of the various dance voices, but also um, for the way in which he, he acts as a role model. Um, both Mtutizele uh, and, of course, his brother, who's, who's mm -hmm. dancing in, in Canada. Um, now so, a principal dancer, by the way. Oh, wow. It's yeah. Just this season, they've just started. Ah, but I, fantastic. I just wanted to highlight as a, as a white woman watching a predominantly black cast with Ballet Black in the same work, so that clip that you watched, um, mm -hmm. it was hugely. Um, I'm trying to find the right words because it was overwhelming to watch the work. It was very mm. powerful. Um, the way he uses the point shoe, those stabbing moments. I mean, I don't think the video mm. itself actually does the work much. Mm. I mean, you get a Justice. flavor for it. Yes, um, yes. I do encourage people, if you do get to watch it live, do watch it live because there's a... Um, you know, like Nijinska in the 1920s used the, the point shoe as a sort of real pulse... Um, change of aesthetic of ballet uh, what Mtutuzeli does is really bring out this sort of is as you said the grief but the physicality of dancing that work mm. I know somebody who um watched rehearsals of Ngoma um in mm. the lead up to um producing it at, at the Linbury at the Royal Opera House in London and this person said to me you know it it, it is a grueling piece of work the, so, so it's interesting mm. to see how those evocative moments, those histories, those insights into the text that he uses, the musical um, mm. composition, uh, the, the poetry that he draws upon, um, the images that he brings out in the work and the physicality of the dancer to use ballet as a vocabulary, let alone the gumboot dancing and mm. all of the rest of the components. Um, fascinating. I mean, I, I thought also, you know, the way in which he accesses the expanse of the stage, you know, I, I, I don't know what the production was like uh, there in London, but certainly... It was on a smaller stage um, was, to your opera, yeah, it was in the Lindbury, yeah. it was a much smaller, more intimate, and it's actually space. watching the dances in an intimate space gave a completely different insight into a va if it was a vast space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in our case, this performance was held on our opera stage with the, you know, the, the scale of, a, I don't know, 36 meters mm -hmm. depth, <laughs> etc. The dancers way, way, way back. And so you have that, that sense of journey and the, you know, journeying into the depths of the earth, which the gold miners face daily. Um, and he was able to evoke that in, in really, you know, the aesthetic that was, was so clean and so clear, but at the same time, so harrowing. Um, and I think that that was an amazing uh, production, which he led, uh, of, of, you know, around an idea that has been explored many, many times by South African artists. Uh, you know, if you think in, in theatre and in terms of protest theatre, the, the, the story of the minor and the loss of the, of the minor and his girlfriend or his mother or, you know, these ideas and themes have been explored uh, extensively. But that's not to take anything away from his particular look at that subject matter again and what that might mean for an audience in the 2020s. Um, and similarly for me, when I think about Dada Masilo's work and the way in which she is, is equally tapping into a kind of zeitgeist um, 
and I have I've sent you that little clip as well of 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 Dada's um, Swan Lake, which is an, is another lovely hot potato uh, um, that we can we can look at when yeah, trying to think more. Yeah, we can't leave the more. women out as much. As <laughs> Uh, we've Absolutely. got Black History Month celebrated in the United Kingdom, so we are celebrating, you know, Black artists and, um, you know, we also are mindful of the women who are out there choreographing, so we had to include a woman, um, and let's see, would you like to show the clip, should we show the clip? Yeah, yes, yeah, brilliant, let's take a look at Dada Masilo, I think be before we, we, we take a look at the work, we, we're going to be looking at um, her Swan Lake, uh, it's quite interesting that Dada has continued her journey with classical ballet uh, through her work in terms of, uh, you know, a, a constant reinvestigation of works like the Giselle, like the Carmen, and then this particular little extract that we're going to look at, uh, the Dada Masiro Swan Lake. Okay, here we go. Oh, thank you for that, Katrina. Yeah, I mean, in, in something like, like this, when it comes to looking at, at Dada Masila, I think if ever you wanted a controversial uh, work that looks at something that's so iconic My in My job is to make college easier because students Oops. have a lot of fun. Apologies. That no, was no. a YouTube... Um, a little announcement I started playing all by itself <laughs> and i was just trying to copy multitask and yes. paste the link um so apologies for that interruption um do continue sorry for that no, not not at all yeah just just saying if ever there was a controversial work when it comes to to swan lake and a work that is so revered by perhaps a ballet community globally um dada's attack in a sense of this of this work is something that is both profound on the one hand and probably disturbing on the other. Um, she looks at, at, at the work from so many different angles. And in that particular clip, what I wanted to highlight was again to, to show how not only is she disrupting the kind of musical form and the patterns and the structure of the work, because you know she doesn't only remain in the Tchaikovsky, she's part of the work also have the, the dying swan. And in fact, she, the, her, her whole journey with this work, as you probably know, begins with her examination uh, performance at Parts in Brussels, where she, she worked with the solo of, of the swan and then incorporated that dying swan solo, um, given her family history and, and AIDS, etc., which she wanted to highlight. But in this particular ec extract that I'm, I'm showing you here, we're seeing not only her kind of... Um, irreverence with the idea of the court ballet and you know which shrieks on stage and it's also an on stage and an off stage position that she's able to disturb and you know if you think about those of us who are professional dancers you know that the backstage space is as much holy ground as is the on stage space you're absolutely silent and focused for your great big ton leve onto the stage and in, in, in Dada's work, you've got this bare stage, there's no scenery, right? There's a couple of lights on side stage and you hear the cacophony of the court dancers prior to the prince arriving. And then you have to deal with her onslaught of her prince who is gay and his lover is Odile. 
and then the question of the marriage uh, of uh, Odette and, and, and the prince. So there's so many complex layers that the work uh, looks at in the way in which it disturbs gender, it disturbs our idea of monarchy, it disturbs just about every aesthetic peg that we could have attached to ballet is untethered in the work. And I find that extraordinarily fascinating in the way in which we can understand both what is an adaptation and perhaps adaption of the classical work that has been made by a young female Black South African artist that again has had much celebration and praise outside of our country, tours in France, tours in the UK. And the work and the USA, is North America. And, yeah, 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 yeah. And the work has still not been performed in its full length in the principal home of ballet in Cape Town, which many might argue is Artscape. So, so that speaks volumes to me about here's a work that does the most extraordinary thing that for us as dance scholars or for those of us who consider ourselves to be researchers in ballet, this work is the most, you know, one of those really, really juicy pieces that you can get into. And, and yet the work is absent on our opera stage in the country of this artist's birth. And, and, and so that's just quite disturbing when, when you think about the, the kinds of struggles that artists are facing in the country to articulate mm -hmm. what might be sitting very, very deeply in, in, you know, in their hearts and, and minds and bodies. Um, and, and those challenges become extraordinary. And I wonder to what extent that these challenges are the same for black and white dancers. In as much as I want to suggest that, uh, you know, all South African choreographers and dancers are facing the same challenges, my sense is that that's not the case, that that legacy of colonialism apartheid is still very much present that's shaping the kind of work and possibilities for people like Dada, for people like Mamela Nyamza, who's, you know, Mamela is from Google Age, she's from here, from, from Cape Town. And, and what are her possibilities? Where does she go? How do we lose people like Tutuzeli November to, to you, you know, to the, to the UK? So on the one hand, yes, he's a great gift. Um, but on the other hand, how do we, we deal with the, not only a kind of brain drain, but a soulful drain if our artists leave, um, leave our countries? So, it's fascinating, yeah. Gerald, because I remember in 2009, I was at the Arts Festival um, mm. in the Eastern Cape. Mm -hmm. And I specifically wanted to go to the Arts Festival because uh, a young choreographer called Dada Masila was presenting uh, Carmen. Uh, Car Carmen, yeah. Our cut before we started, um, but we did eventually <laughs> make our way into the hall. Um, and it became sort of, you know, I was starting to see this young choreographer flexing her muscles across her identities, her different identities and her, yes. if I wouldn't say maybe re eventually now seeing her work at Sadler's Wells back in 2014, so five years later, yeah. was there some kind of reconciliation between the art forms that she has grappled with? Um, same with him to early November, you know, that he's yeah. grappling with vocabularies uh, but choosing to, to really bring his South African identity, not just ballets about anything or any other subject, mm. but to mm. bring his subject matter to the fore with a company that, you know, Ballet Black was created for um, Asian, or certainly we can call them non-white dancers, because it's not just about Black dancers, it's also about Asian dancers. And um, I think whilst it is, yes, a, a bit of a loss for the South African context, I do think there's a there's a key um, renaissance, certainly in this country, to really begin to reconcile, you know, think about the arts and to think about how sort of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, those emigres are fitting in. Um, fascinating conversation, which I know can go on for, we can talk forever, as we always <laughs> have done, spoken forever. Um, yes. Years, but I'd like to open up for any questions. Please do write in your questions in the chat if you want to. I can see um, 
uh, Sarah Lee Castlin said, you know, good point about those that have paved the way before. So really important to to acknowledge all of those, um, uh, mm. you know, the, the, the absent histories that, you know, people may not be aware of uh, that that in a way, Mtutuzeli and Dada fit in within their ancestors, mm. you know, within the within yeah. The community. Yeah. So we'll open up. I mean, the I oh, sorry. Go ahead, Gerald. No, no, no. I was also going to say that I, you know, I, I think it's it's also quite interesting when we look at those two specific artists. That on the one hand, one could argue that Masilo remains within the Western aesthetic frame and remains with iconic works like Giselle, like her Carmen, etc. And these could be positioned as Eurocentric uh, themes. And yet at the same time, loss, betrayal, love, you know, these are universal themes. And so it, it's, it's interesting how the artists, you know, I mean, for those of us and many of us who had periods in our life where we worked as freelance artists. And so you go where the money is, you go where you're being supported and your work is supported. So, which is why Vincent Mansui is out of the country, which is why Gregory McCormack is out of the country so often, Desiree Davids, etc. So these artists are continuing to try and make their work because they also need a living. Um, and uh, so on, on the one hand, one can be critical about their choice to you know to remain within a specific frame but on the other hand it's also a question of the resources and and funding opportunities that exist or don't exist for these for these artists uh, I'm at